Hey guys, Chris here. Tonight we have a story from one of our viewers that was sent to me from a man in British Columbia, Canada. And he went camping with his son and his son brought a friend. And that night he had an encounter with something that was about 10 feet away from him and he was terrified. That's next. It was very wide. It was, its head was twice the size of mine. I could make out the size of its shoulders, which were, and I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm six foot three, 310 pounds. And this thing just made me look like a, a, a rag doll. Interesting, we have a, kind of a cave I'm gonna be in tonight. Should make it kind of cool, <laughs> literally. It's more like a big rock overhang. Check it out. I believe this is called the Washoe Cave. Check this out. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Like I said, it's a big overhang, so let's see if we can show it off here but yeah that'll be that'll be where we do our story tonight and our beer okay so tonight's beer is called the blonde ale and it's from the belching beaver brewing company and it says it's brewed with honey and fortunately I was able to find a, a small spring in a side canyon hiking earlier this evening and I was able to cool my beer down so all right I've never done a story from a cave before so this is kind of cool cave I guess <laughs> all right belching beaver we'll put that in the cup tonight so oh I always get the frosty top. <laughs> so I got this story from one of my viewers, one of our viewers. I believe he's a subscriber. His name is Rob. And Rob lives in British Columbia, Canada on the island of Vancouver, Vancouver Island. In a town called Comox. And Vancouver Island is the largest island on the west coast of North America. It's quite huge. It's about 285 miles long or so. It does have people living on it, but it is a wilderness island for the most part. But there's people that live on the east side of it, and there's a main highway. And then the town uh, city of Victoria is at the south east part of the island. Amazing place, rainforest, there's whale watching up there off the coast, there's bears, I believe there's grizzly bears. So this story was from Rob. Rob lives in Comox and he likes to camp. He took his son camping and then his son wanted to bring his buddy and they were both nine years old and Rob was a uh, 
Canadian Army veteran. And he just loved to camp and he wanted to just take his son camping. In 2003, they went to Comox Lake. Really good sized lake, not too far from Comox, surrounded by pine trees and then mountains around that. Very steep mountains. Uh, a couple of campgrounds on the lake and there's one right on the lake. And then they were staying at a smaller campground about 10 minutes away from the lake. Five campsites at the base of the mountain. It comes down and it's kind of flat and then it works its way down to the lake. And this campground's tucked up against the base of the mountain. Like I said, surrounds the lake. Just beautiful area. And the kids were really excited. They spent the day hanging out at the campground. Right in, mostly in the campsite, but they did walk down to the lake, 10 minute walk, hung out there, came back, and then they built a campfire. Uh, Rob showed them, you know, how to split the wood with an axe, how to use a knife. He had a buck knife he liked to wear on his belt. Teach the kids make a fire, all that kind of stuff, camp craft. And his dad taught him, and he thought it'd be really fun to teach his son and his buddy and they made a nice dinner hung out a little bit and then they went to bed about let's say nine o'clock nice starry night and it can rain up there it can rain quite a bit uh, on the west coast of canada with and there's a lot of islands up there but this particular night was pretty clear night uh, no moon out and he put the kids down about nine o'clock, went back, stoked up the fire, was just hanging out, relaxing. And then he hears his son from the tent and his son goes, Daddy, hey, Daddy. And he's like, yeah, well, son, what's up? And he walks over to the tent, unzips it, walks, steps into the tent. Yeah, what's going on? And his son says, I hear growling. He goes, I hear growling, Daddy. Can you go take care of that? And, and he thought it was the kid's imagination, nine years old, he's in the woods, you know, in a tent. Because he had been sitting out at the campfire last hour or so, didn't see or hear anything around the tent, nothing. And he thought, well, he's imagining something. But, you know, he didn't want to dismiss him, so he's like, okay, Daddy will take care of it. You go back to sleep, and I got my, my axe and my knife here and my flashlight, so we'll go check it out and make sure everything's fine, but don't you worry about it, and you go back to sleep, okay? Just go back to sleep. He goes, all right, Daddy, thank you. Leaves the tent, zips it back up, and he's still kind of talking to him, yeah, I don't see anything. Everything looks good. Daddy's here. We're going to check it out, though. You go to sleep. So he walks back over to the campfire, puts a couple more logs on it, stokes it up so it's a little higher. And you can see the light going up into the treetops and flickering, and it's heading down towards the other campsites. And again, there's only five campsites in this whole campground. So he says, okay, I'm gonna go look around now, kind of search the campground, just, just to make him feel good and just, you know, just check it out. So he goes down the little road, looks on the right, looks in the campsite with the flashlight, and he's looking, looking, picnic table, trees, it's dark in the way in the back, but everything's fine. Then he goes to the left campsite, the other side of the road, same thing, takes a flashlight, shines it in there, looks around, picnic table, fire pit, nothing. And he goes down the road just a little bit further. And he's only about 30 feet from his campsite where the kids are. And it's, it's not a very big campground. And he sees this tree in the third campsite, big tree, 
And he's looking on the left side, and you can see the picnic table over there. Nothing, everything's good. Looks on this side of the tree, everything's good. And then he goes around the back of this tree. And then he sees something that just shocks him. He sees like a silhouette, very wide silhouette of an upright animal on two feet. And that's just, he's just shining his flashlight slowly and he slowly goes up about a 60 degree angle, I guess, just like that. He doesn't go all the way up to the top and he can see an eye shine, red, amber eye shine, two eyes looking right at him, maybe 10 feet away, maybe a little bit further, maybe 15, but just 10-ish feet away from him. He's petrified. And in, in just in this moment, he has this thought that it felt like he was at the grocery store and he's coming down the aisle, goes around the corner and comes up the next aisle and he sees a Brahma bull standing in the middle of the aisle staring straight at him. That's what it felt like. It's just this strange juxtaposition of reality and surreal colliding, right? And he's looking at this thing and this just all happened in about eight or ten seconds. He sees clearly the muscles and he sees the shoulders the outline of the shoulders and it's two it's on two feet covered in hair and he's still holding the flashlight and he can see the face and the head is giant it's two times larger than he, than a regular head and he's six feet three inches tall 310 pounds and it made him like he said, feel like some kind of a, a rag doll in scale to this thing. And you can see the face, you can see his lips, a nose, and then you can see again the eye shine with the red amber eyes. And it's slowly rocking back and forth, back and forth like that. And it does that one, two, three and when it comes back this side he sees another pair of eyes come out from the side of this thing and his fear level was a nine or a ten just frozen with fear and once he saw the other pair of eyes, they were about, like, here's my head, and here's, the, let's say these are the eyes right here. They were somewhere like here. Once he saw those, his fear level went to a 15. Because if you know anything about animals, wild animals, when it comes to their, their offspring and the parent, they're very protective, defensive, and can be aggressive. Think like a grizzly bear with cubs, mountain lion with mountain lion cubs. And they will, it's in their DNA, they will fight to the death to protect themselves and, of course, their cubs. And so the danger level just felt like it went up exponentially. And now he was just petrified. And he also had this thought that, he thought that maybe this larger one was holding the one, it was like hanging off the shoulder of it. That was his first thought, that it was just, she was holding the offspring. Or be because of the night and depth of field, or maybe it was standing behind it and it just peered out from behind it. And now he's looking at two sets of eyes staring right at him, 10 feet or so away. And the kids are 30 feet back and now he's fearful for the kids in the tent. And Rob had 
like I said, he was a Canadian Army veteran, done four tours, training, and I believe 20 years of service for Canada. And so he wisely didn't overreact and yell or scream, number one. He didn't turn and run, number two. You don't do that with, with wild animals. So take a grizzly bear, for example. If you were to see a grizzly bear on the trail walking towards you, number one, you would want to get off the trail. Slowly step off the trail. Number two, you would want to not make direct eye contact with the bear. They take that as the threat. Put your head down, keep an eye on them, but don't make direct eye contact. Number three, you would want to slowly move away from the trail and allow the bear, if he wanted to, to come through and just not be a threat. You're just trying to back down. They say there's fight or flight, but this is, with a bear, you don't want to do, you don't want to fight and you don't want to turn and run. That would kind of be flight. So you, you want to just diffuse the situation. So this is what Rob did. He took the flashlight, slowly lowered it, took his head and turned it down, kept his eye on him, and started slowly walking backwards. Carefully, so as not to trip or something. And as he slowly dropped the flashlight and went backwards towards the camp, he could slowly see the shape and everything kind of fade back into the darkness. And he knew they were still there because he did not hear anything through this whole encounter. He didn't hear anything, he didn't smell anything, but he clearly saw them. And then he worked his way all the way back to the campground, couldn't see them anymore, took some firewood, put it on the fire, stoked it up as best he could. On the left side was the, the car next to the tent. Fire was in front of the tent, kind of off to the corner, and then he put a chair on the other side of the tent and sat in that chair with the kids behind him thinking he may have to protect the kids. He's like the last line of defense. He had his hatchet with him, he had his flashlight and he had his knife on his belt and he sat in that chair all night long, did not sleep at all, nerve-wracking night, totally nerve-wracking, and any sound that he heard, anything, he would turn his head, turn his head, and he was alert all night long, just in case something was to happen. He didn't hear anything else. Finally, the sun came up. <sighs> Kids were waking up, and about eight o'clock or so, some other campers pulled in to the campsite right across from them, set up their tent, and he felt some relief, and that was the sun was out now, it was morning, and he told the kids, he goes, kids, don't go anywhere, don't go down to the lake, don't leave the campsite, stay right here. And they're good kids, this is what he said, they're really good kids, they'll listen. And he, lay down in the tent and just crashed for like 45 minutes. He just had to. He was just exhausted and he knew that he um, couldn't drive home and do everything he needed to do without some kind of, you know, recharging his batteries, right? He gets up and he goes back to the spot because he had to see what was going on back there. And he could see the big tree and behind the big tree was a stump and behind the stump was a slight drop off, five foot drop off into a gully. And then there was a path leading off to the woods and you could see the thick woods back there and then behind that it goes up towards the mountain that I mentioned earlier. And so he could see about where this thing and its probable offspring was standing and it was, I believe from the story, it was, down in a uh, in the gully but it was still 
which was about five feet deep, and then it was two plus feet tall above the stump. So that made him almost eight feet tall, this thing that he saw. And he made these calculations based on, you know, like I said, the, the gully and the sump and what, where he remembered seeing the eyes. So he makes these calculations, figures it's about seven and a half, eight feet tall. And then he looks for footprints, doesn't see any. It's packed dirt, pine needles. And he's, okay, we got to get out of here. And goes back to camp, finished packing up the camp, loading it up, doesn't tell the kids what's going on. And then they leave. They're, they're gone. <laughs> they're, they're just gone. And he remembered <clears throat> they had been in the camp pretty much all day. You know, we're playing with the knives and making fires and, you know, just hanging out in the camp, you know. It's kind of fun to do that and not feel pressure to be, you know, hiking all over and doing stuff and just kind of enjoying just being there. And he had this thought that this thing that he saw, it looked like they were observing him, but he kind of caught it observing them that night. And so he was thinking throughout the day, this thing was maybe observing them throughout the day or at least part of the day because it was just standing there and that was his thought that he had during this summer trip at Comax Lake in 2003. <sighs> that is my story for tonight. You guys liking this cave? It's pretty spooky. <laughs> it's huge. It doesn't go back, you know, 100 feet. I mean, you can see it goes back, I don't know, it's, it's probably 25 feet deep, though. Just this big overhang. <laughs> I may have to do another story here. If you guys like this, this is, this is kind of cool. And I got the uh, West Fork of the Carson River right over here. Or maybe it's the East Fork, but I got the Carson River right over here. I'm looking at it. <laughs> so, all right, you guys. Uh, more to come. I got... Uh, I want to go up the Carson Pass and do a, uh, a story up there. It's absolutely beautiful. There's snow-capped mountains around there, and I can hike off. I don't have to hike too far, and I can get into some rock outcrops and do a story from up there. So that's what, what I want to do next. And I got a bunch of other stuff planned, so looking forward to it. So thank you for watching, as always. I really appreciate you guys. And if you guys like hiking and backpacking, camping, and stories about the strange, unexplained, and things that go bump or scream in the night. Like, subscribe, and comment. I appreciate that, as always. So, all right, thanks again, and we will see you on the next one. Keep hiking.